Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, New York Community Bank, m and Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Collier's International NYC, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringhoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. West Grove, Pennsylvania. Nah, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna sketch. I'm, I like art. I, I, I like buildings. Nah, you know, I'm gonna join the military. Never been out of the country. Gonna go to Germany. You know what? My parents moved to uh, Virginia. Maybe I'll get to Virginia. Uh, I'll go to a community school. I'll go to the University of Virginia. I'm going to come to the Apple. I'm going to come to New York City. Uh, I'm going to get a job with a small firm. No, I'm going to get involved with Green Hill, Oxif. You know what? I, I really love real estate. I want to become a developer. I want to develop in New York. I want to develop in Florida. I want to develop in San Francisco. So over the last 10 years, I've developed a lot. I have the CEO and founder, Joe McMillan of DDG. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure. Tell me about the, your parents. Tell me about the family. I, I remember one side of the family goes back many years ago from Scotland. So tell me about the, your father's side and then your mother's side. Yeah, so uh, pleasure to be here. But my father's side of the family, my father's family was from Scotland and Norway. On my grandfather's side goes back to Scotland, and one of my relatives came over around uh, 1755, I believe. Where they settled? Uh, they settled in North Carolina. They settled in uh, Piney Creek, North Carolina, which is in the uh, Appalachian Mountains. And on my grandmother's side, his mother, they were originally from Norway and then uh, did a short stop in France and then came here in the 1600s. And so the family goes back, goes back a ways. And on my mother's side, uh, my mother was originally from Florida, Jacksonville, and her parents and uh, grandparents were from the Carolinas. So tell me about dad. Where was he born? Uh, my dad was born in Chester County. He was born in Westchester, Pennsylvania, in the same uh, you know, general area that, that I was born in. And he subsequently was in the military, was in the Vietnam War? My father was on the USS uh, Saratoga. He served uh, in the 1960s for four years. And then he, then he had this opportunity, went to Jacksonville, right? Jacksonville, Florida. And met this woman. Yes, well the, the ship he was on was t stationed uh, ultimately in Jacksonville and he met my mother in Jacksonville, Florida. They were set up on a blind date and uh, they were married, I think they were engaged within six weeks and married shortly thereafter. Now what did mom do? 
Uh, at the time, my parents met my mother was working for a department store company. So she leaves Jacksonville and comes to Pennsylvania with you, Dad? She did, yes. They left Jacksonville. They moved to Pennsylvania. They lived with my grandparents in West Grove, which was uh, the town I grew up in. And they moved in with my, you know, my, my mother, my father, you know, various other family in a very confined space. Now, you said to me your dad went to school. It took him a number of years at night, right? Yes. Yes. My father went to night school uh, at Widener University. It's uh, in Chester, Pennsylvania, probably about an hour from where we grew up. And he went to eight years of night school. He worked uh, as an electronics technician during the day and eight years of night school at night to get his engineering degree. And then what happened afterwards with his engineering? Uh, he got a job at DuPont. And so he became an engineer at DuPont and worked at various different other plants uh, over the course of about 20 years. So tell me a little bit about uh, you, you and your family. When were you born? I was born November 9th, 1971. And you lived in this small two-bedroom house you told me about? Yeah, we uh, lived in a you know, small town, one traffic light, uh, volunteer fire department. And we had a, was six of us living in about 1,000 square feet. We had two bedrooms, one bathroom. Right, then you were upstairs, right? Uh, I did, yes. I slept in the attic with my two older brothers. And so it was... Uh, where, where was the age difference between you and your brothers? Uh, there's about a 10-year age difference. And so my brothers, one is 10 years older, one is 8 years older, my sister's 3 years older, and then there's me. Right, and you said to me you have that family reunion recently. Um, uh, we did. We had a family reunion uh, a couple days ago where we had about 53, 54 of us. First time uh, we got together in 30 years since... Uh, 19, 30 years? 30 years, yeah. 1988 was the last time we got the whole family together. And what are, what are the brothers doing in the sister today? Uh, well, my one brother is uh, an HVAC repair specialist. My other uh, brother uh, works for a uh, HVAC warehouse. He manages a warehouse. And my sister uh, runs a cleaning business. And they were all still in Westchester? Uh, my brothers moved back to Jacksonville, where my mother was from. And my sister lives in the same town we grew up in. And uh, her daughter goes to the same school that uh, we went to. Which you said to me, I think, what, there was 160 kids in the school? Yeah, it was a consolidated school district. So we grew up in a very small town, but there was a series of small towns within about 20 minutes of each other. So all those small towns in the countryside sent the children to a consolidated school. So all the town had 1,800. We had 160, but that drew from five or six different areas. Let's talk about growing up in a small rural town. You told me you had... Shovel, you had a couple of jobs, uh, I mean, restaurant work. Tell me about some of the jobs you did as a kid. The first job I had was shoveling snow in the winter, uh, mowing lawns in the summer, and doing landscape garden work pretty much year-round. Those were my right, first jobs. You, so there was also some restaurant work. Yeah, when I got older, I did restaurant work. When I was started around 12, I started working uh, as a dishwasher in a restaurant. And so that was my first uh so yeah. let's talk about the sketching, which got you interested in real estate years ago. How'd that happen? When I was a child, I was fascinated uh, by drawing. And I used to sketch. I'd sketch uh, buildings, houses, landscapes. And so my parents bought me a, a portable sketchbook that had colored pencils in it, charcoals in it, paper in it. And wherever we went, I would carry it. I'd lay it out on the floor, and I'd sit there, and I'd sketch for an hour or two or whatever, how long we were there. And then... It was time to go. My parents would tell me to pack it up. I'd pack it up, and then we'd go wherever else we were going next. Now, you said you grew up very provincial, okay? You really never left Pennsylvania, right? Uh, I had left Pennsylvania a handful of times to visit the grandparents in Florida, but until I went in the Army, I'd been on a plane once. And you had, had you been to New York City? No. I'd never been to New York City until the 95-96, so... New Year's Eve of 95 coming into 1996. Talk to me about public school and high school. Yes. And then how you decided after high school that you wanted to join the military. Yeah, well, I, traditional country upbringing, uh, as far as the military goes, my father had been in the military, my uncle had been in the military, both my older brothers had been in the military. And so I was, you know, looking around, figuring out, okay, what did I want to do next in my life? Wasn't really ready for college, didn't know 100% what I wanted to do. So the military seemed like a logical option. So I met with the four different branches, five different branches of the service, and uh, selected the Army. So tell me about your initial Army experience. My basic training was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, 
which is in a town called Lawton. And my advanced training was at, in El Paso at Fort Bliss, Texas. Now, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where I spent my advanced training in the military, was cannoneers predominantly. They, they made a basic training later on? Uh, they did do basic training, correct. They did basic there. It was air defense artillery. You know, we're, we're not, air defense was at Fort Bliss, but the artillery, traditional artillery, was uh, the cannoneers, as you say, in Oklahoma. So I did, uh, from, went in in July of 90 into you know, Oklahoma, and two months later, I uh, went to uh, El Paso. And what happens after El Paso? Uh, I got picked up and sent to Germany. They asked me for my preferred duty station, and I picked Hawaii. And they said, okay, that's great. We're sending you to Germany. And what do you do in Germany besides have a good time? Uh, you were lucky because you didn't have to get involved with the Gulf War. You were... Could have been. I, I did. I had a number of friends who were in the first Gulf War. I was stationed in Germany for, for that period of time, for two years. And we did uh, missile maintenance, general you know, procurement, uh, you know, maintain the facilities. You know, it was still, the, the Berlin Wall had fallen in 89, so this is 90, so it wasn't that much after. So we still had a significant presence in Germany. And so we did, we did uh, you know, routine things. You said you went to Italy, you traveled around? I did. I traveled uh, my first ever trip to Venice, uh, my first ever trip to Austria. I've since been back numerous times. Traveled around uh, parts of Bavaria where I was stationed. So, part of, you know, southern, southern, uh, you know, southern Germany and, and some of the surrounding countries I got to see. So how long did you stay in the military? I was in for uh, about two and a half years. And I got out and, and uh, moved back to the States. Okay, so you finished the military and now you moved back to Virginia where your parents were right now. Correct. Correct. The, so your parents, your father had relocated for DuPont to be in uh, Virginia. Correct. My, my parents moved the same week I graduated high school from Pennsylvania to Virginia. So Pennsylvania, I, they, they had severed uh, those ties and were in a new state. So I went home to, to live with them when I got out of the military. So what do you decide to do? Did you go to a community college originally? Uh, first thing I did for the I, uh, I was... I basically got a job uh, as a, you know, in the life insurance business for about uh, six months. Doing what? Uh, I was, uh, you know, underwriting, selling, you know, and uh, trying to trying to figure out my financial acumen. Which life insurance company? You didn't tell me that. Uh, well, it was, a, it was one of the the old debit companies. Yeah, you know, like there was you know Pyramid, Jefferson Pilot. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, and so we, I was working for a debit company. And how'd you like that? I. Didn't really like it. I didn't uh, necessarily think it was what I wanted to do for the next, you know, 20, 30 years. No. So you did that before you went back to uh, the community college? Correct. I did that, and then I enrolled in the community college. There was a local school where my parents lived, and uh, started taking classes, taking my basic, you know, English, literature, mathematics, science, sciences, et cetera. So how do you elevate yourself from the community college to the prominent University of Virginia? I... Yeah, you know, was was you know very blessed, uh, very fortunate that uh, I applied to University of Virginia and got in. It's the only school I applied to. I looked around the state and concluded that was where I wanted to go, and they accepted me. And the good part was you had the GI Bill. I did. I did have the GI Bill. Without the GI Bill, I don't know if I would have gone to college. I mean, it it was instrumental for me. It afforded me the ability to basically pay for school. Otherwise, I had no means to pay for it. So you're at the University of Virginia. What did you decide to study in? I studied uh, commerce, a uh, Bachelor of Science in Commerce, concentration in finance. So I have a business finance degree. And what do you do during the summers? Uh, during the summer, actually, in, in order to, I graduated inside of three years. From, I started school in 93 and graduated in 96, so I went to school through the summers. And it was because of the GI Bill which aided that. So it's 1996, you hadn't really been around. What happens, how do you arrive in the Big Apple? The, you know, my senior year at uh, Virginia, they call it the fourth year, their one, two, three, four system, uh, there was interviews on grounds, on campus, and Goldman Sachs came, Morgan Stanley came, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, you can go down the list, you know, J.P. Morgan. There was a boutique investment bank called Bar Devlin that came. And I interviewed. I concluded I wanted to be in investment banking. And, and talking to a lot of my, my friends, it, it seemed like that was a, a good fit for me at the time. And I interviewed and was offered the chance to come to New York to interview. And I came to New York. My first, my first trip for a job interview was in February of 96. Since so I had been here 
in New Year's Eve a couple months before, came here in February of 96, and I moved here in, in June. So, July. what kind of firm was Bard Devlin? Bard Devlin was focused on energy mergers and acquisitions. It was founded by uh, two uh, former pre IPO Morgan Stanley partners. They had left, they started this firm, and they then subsequently sold it to Societe Generale, SockGen. And so, we, we did a lot of mergers. And, around the country. So what are you, an analyst at this I was time? an analyst, yeah. I was an investment banking analyst. So if you know what that means, I basically... You work 20 hours a day. Or more. 20 hours, you know, in your words, 20 hours a day. You did the pitch books, you did the models, you went to the printers, you did anything and everything there was to do, you did it. But you also said in between the time that you had, you, you enjoyed looking around, walking around the city, maybe with your sketchbook over there, and you always looked at the real estate. I did enjoy walking around the city and looking at real estate. At this point, I wasn't carrying the sketchbook anymore. I would spend my Sundays going to open houses out of the New York Times. And so I'd go through, this is before it was all online, you go through the New York Times and open house here, open house there. I'd look for condominium open houses and I would go and look at apartments. Now, where were you living at this time? Uh, my first apartment was in Hell's Kitchen. I spent 14 years in Hell's Kitchen. So I lived on, in a Rose Associates building at uh, 52nd and 8th called the Ellington. And then? I moved to uh, a Stonehenge building, ironically, because I know these people now. I didn't know who they were right. then, on uh, 48th called the Ritz Plaza. Sure, I knew the Ritz Plaza rather well. And my third building was a Brodsky building. And so I went from one, from one real estate family kind of the next to the next. And you went to the Brodsky family building on 60th? or uh, I went to one on 43rd and 9th. Okay, so you okay. stayed truly in the same Yes, I stayed within there. about a five-block radius for 14 So years. how do you decide to leave the, uh, the boutique investment firm and go to Green Hill? Uh, the, the firm was sold to Societe Generale, and about this time I had read, uh, I know, you know, fantastic firm, but you know, it's a big firm, whereas I was at a boutique before, uh, wanted to maintain that more personal experience. I had read an article about Bob Greenhill, who was, president of Morgan Stanley, and then he was CEO of Solly Smith Barney, and then he started his own firm. And so I cold called uh, over to Green Hill and couldn't get him on the phone, but I got somebody else on the phone. And two months later, I'd gotten a job. And what were you doing at Green Hill? I was there, I started as an analyst, and then was associate, and then vice president, and then principal. I was there for, for a number of years, and so I got promoted up. And what type of work did you do at Green Hill? I mean, was it real estate oriented, or was it getting close to real estate? Uh, I did a little bit of real estate. It, at Green Hill, initially, I was a generalist. I did uh, energy, I did corporate, I did some tech, did a little bit of real estate. It was varied. Started out working in the M&A business, and then we raised a series of private equity funds. We raised a first and second fund, so I worked in that business when, we were, when doing that. And it, was, it was a varied experience over time. So how do you decide to leave Green Hill, great firm, and then decide to go to Oxif? Uh, I was rec recruited away. I got a call, um, you know, it was a very attractive opportunity for, it was a very hard decision, you know, when I left Green Hill, very, very difficult. Uh, but the offer that I had on the table was, was extremely compelling, and so I chose to, to go and-, and So wh what, what do you do with Oxif now? Oxif, I was on the uh, private equity side as well. And so at Oxif, we had both a private equity book and a public equity book. And so I covered uh, a lot of the PE stuff. We did a lot of oil and gas. We did a little bit of real estate, a little bit of corporate. Covered the MLPs, which are publicly traded uh, energy partnerships. And so I did, I did both those things while I was there. So during this period of time, besides going to the open houses, how do you, in, in the beginning of, the, in the midst of the recession of 2008, right? I, I left Oxif in 08, yes. Right. How do you decide to uh, strike it out on your own? You know, the kid from Pennsylvania and the big bad apple over here and to decide to become a real estate developer? I, like, as I said, I'd started out looking on way back in the, in the 90s, you know, looking at real estate opportunities into the two, early 2000s. I was uh, attempting to buy small buildings. I was attempting to buy condos and was gonna fix them up and flip them. Could never make it work. And so what I concluded is I needed to get my feet wet. And so I went out and started meeting with people, potential partners, uh, that I could JV, G, JV with and you know, do, do something and ended up investing in a deal uh, with uh, someone I'm still partners with today on 17th Street. It's the first condo deal that, that I invested in. And 17th would, Street and where? Uh, 17th Street by uh, Stuyvesant. And so it's, you know, it's, you know, it's two, 235 East 17th Street. And so we you know, basically did that deal and I liked it and I would try and get out of the office as much as I could to go and walk the site or be, you know, be at the job, you know, meet whomever. 
and realized I, I enjoyed that. And both. But, but you were taking a big risk. I mean, you, you were making, you were principal at Oxf, right? Uh, we, titles were very fluid at Oxf, but. You were senior. Yeah, I, I, was, I had a good position. You had right. a good position of Oxf, and you had done the 17th Street deal. So how do you create DDG? Well, it was, a, it was actually a good time in the market because there were, there were cracks. I mean, it was clear there were cracks in the market. Um, you know, I thought about doing it, you know, two years earlier in 2006, spoke with some potential partners and it just didn't, you know, didn't make sense. It seemed like it was too early. And I got some guidance from, from various people in the business, some long term, you know, 30, 40 years in the business saying now's not the time. And so waited and then just it felt like the timing was right. And so took the leap. So you take the leap, but how do you find the first property? Uh, it was a lot of work. Basically, the, uh, the first property came through uh, the law firm that had drafted the formation docs for the company, uh, Goldfarb and Fleece, uh, which is, you know, does a lot of work with the Rudens, you know, been with them for, for a very long time. Said they have a client, asked us to make a couple calls, and... It happened to be one of the calls that they made, and so we stayed on that deal for probably you know that, nine months was, to a year. Now that was 14th Street. No, that was 41 Bond Street. 41 Bond. 41 Bond Street, uh, and so that's that's how we sourced the first deal, and then from there it was it was a series of you, you do one deal, but get the second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. But but you you went into the meatpacking district at at its initial heyday, 2010, April right. 2010. And how'd you find that site? Uh, that site was. Ironically enough, they had a big sign uh, in the window that basically said, you know, building for sale, call this number. And so, you know, and I had also known you know, a couple of brokers at that by that point, having started the company a year before. And between calling and having the brokers make an intro, we got into a discussion and ended up buying the property. And how did that do? That deal did exceptionally well. We did... Uh, the first deal we bought on Bond Street was a property in, in, in the verge of foreclosure. Second one was a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So we got great basis on those. And then the sellouts for both were, were fantastic. Now, how'd you get down to Tribeca? Uh, Tribeca was another distressed deal, was REO. I mean, so if you look at a lot of our portfolio, about half the portfolio had some distress component, whether it's foreclosure, deed in lieu, REO, bankruptcy, and you know, try and make as much money as you can on what, the buy. What about the Tootsie Row? Uh, that was a bankruptcy, Lehman Brothers. That was out of the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. So how do you decide to uh, venture into San Francisco? I mean, because your business is new, was New York City, predominantly condominiums. Correct. Well, well, you got to San Francisco, you got to Brooklyn, you got to Florida. Let's talk about all those different opportunities. Yeah, well, Manhattan, Brooklyn, I mean, they're both fantastic. If you look at the five boroughs, I mean, New York is, is obviously a special place. And there are a handful of cities around the country that have some similar characteristics to New York City. You want to have some sort of you know, land constraint, some sort of uh, capacity constraint, something special. If you look at San Francisco, San Francisco is basically a peninsula surrounded on water by three sides, although a lot of people don't realize it. You know, Manhattan's surrounded by water, that's similar. Uh, if you look at what we're doing in Florida, you know, we're on the ocean. It's hard to find oceanfront land to build a building, so we're building a condo there. And you could go, you know, Boston's great. You know, if you look at LA, I mean, you can go you know, Chicago's on the water. There's a handful of cities that you know, have, have special, uh, special characteristics where it makes the investment compelling. But how do you decide on uh, go, getting involved with Brooklyn? I mean, there were five boroughs, I agree. Right. I think if you look at the, from a pricing perspective, the pricing in Brooklyn is the closest to Manhattan. You know, we went into Brooklyn Heights. And so, uh, it, you know, we set records in Brooklyn Heights. And it's, it, there's a lot of crossover between Manhattan and Brooklyn, and so it was a logical next step given that we just know, know the pool. Uh, most of the time when you were in Manhattan, you were closer east of 42nd Street, as they would say. How did you decide to get up to 88th Street and 3rd Avenue? Yeah, we were drawn just by the, the, the demographic shifts. If you look at a lot of the schools, the schools up there are fantastic. I mean, I think if you, if you look around you know, Manhattan in particular, lots of the, the best schools in the city, public or private, are on the Upper East Side. And so that really attracted us. We also thought that there was a little bit of a, a reverse mentality to it because so much time and attention had been focused downtown. A lot of you know, uh, residents were moving downtown. A lot of developers were focusing downtown. We wanted to do a little bit of the inverse and think, okay, what's the next step? If everyone's moving here, where should we move next? 
And that, that was part of the thesis as well. So, so what's that called, that property on 88th called? 180 East 88th. Now you're also, talk to me about Florida, what you're doing over there. Uh, we have uh, our first project in Florida is at 3550 South Ocean in South Palm Beach. We're building an oceanfront uh, condominium with uh, fantastic amenities, parking, you know, gated security, 24-7 concierge. So where do you see the next opportunity for DDG? Oh, it's, that's, that's a hard question. I mean, we, we see opportunities all the time. You know, the markets we're in, we see new markets presented to us. It just, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say. So where does Joe McMillan want to be <laughs> in, in, in 10 years? Oh, my God, that's a, that's a hard question. Uh, at some point, I think about a family. You know, I'm not, not getting any younger. And so I think that's a possibility at some point. Uh, I'd like to continue doing what I'm doing. I love what I do. You know, I, I don't go to work every day. I get up and do what I wanted to do and what I was passionate about for years. And so I want to keep doing what I'm doing. And now, you said to me you want to get more involved giving back maybe with the military, right? Correct. Yeah, I mean, I am a veteran. And that's something that's very, very near and dear to me and very personal. And I've had discussions with, with some other veterans who were in real estate and or who you know, are, are you know, very much advocates for, for veterans. There are not a lot of veterans in real estate. And so I think that's a good place to start to try and you know, create opportunity. You know, like you mentioned to me, it's, you know, we talked about Fleet Week. You know, I think that uh, you know, there, there's, just, there's not enough opportunity for veterans in New York City real estate. And that's something I'd like to change. Speaking about veterans, let's talk about uh, the family. Uh, you, your father passed on last year, you said, Correct. right? Yes. And your mother is also deceased. Yes. So talk to me about what your brothers and sisters are doing today. Uh, well, my two brothers live in Jacksonville, Florida, which is where my mother was from. And my, my father's whole family lives within about 20 minutes of each other in Pennsylvania. And my mother's is about, is about 20 minutes of each other in Jacksonville, Florida. So it's a very similar. They, they live down there and they... Uh, yeah, have, one of them's married, one of them's not. You know, they have very full lives. And uh, we had our first family reunion in 30 years. So last weekend, uh, first time we got all the cousins together and my 82-year-old aunt who's, you know. So it's interesting, you know, from the sketchbook, you know, to the military to today, you've done a lot in your short period of time, and I'm certain it's only going to continue for the future. And thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael.